Okay, so welcome everyone. Glad to have you all joining us. And so grateful for another awesome series of our Lunch and Learn on Mi'kmaq culture and heritage uh, facilitated by the phenomenal artist and educator, Gerald Glode, who um, is with the Mi'kmaq Way Bebert Cultural Center. And we are so grateful to have him with us. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, whose inherent rights were recognized in the peace and friendship treaties that were signed from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982. And they remain active to this day. I take this moment to commit to the necessary process of decolonization and reconciliation and to learning to become a better treaty partner as an expression of my gratitude for living and working here in Mi'kma'ki. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers commits to translating this acknowledgement into action, recognizing that the profession of social work has participated in the genocide of indigenous people through its part in supporting the implementation of residential schools and affirming the approach to child welfare that led to the 60s swoop through the promotion of discriminatory policies with the underlying motivation to dispossess Indigenous peoples from their land. By seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, especially those regarding education, we commit to doing what we can to restore the human dignity of victims of violence and call governments and citizens to account. Let us take this moment to pause in gratitude for all of the wise Mi'kmaq elders and Ilnu community leaders who have and continue to heroically care for and advocate for this land. May we join them in this work. Let us take a deep breath and recenter ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world with harmful energy for the ways it has perpetuated genocide, white supremacy, queer phobia, and the destruction of our planet. Let us take this moment to affirm our commitment to join in the important work of decolonization, which has affected so many. Let us take this moment to commit to justice and healing. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice, and this community that we share by working for justice for all human beings as an expression of our gratitude, as well as an expression of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we all must begin to learn and honor. May our session today lead us to be in right relationship with this land, and one another. And with that, I am going to ask Gerald to um, open his uh, open his camera. There we go. Okay. So very grateful to have Gerald once again uh, here to speak to us and teach us. Um, so Gerald, over to you. Thank you again. Okay, well, thank you very much. And again, uh, I think this is number five in the presentation list, and uh, it's going to be on sort of the um, traditional stories of the Mi'kmaq people in the form of the Goose Cap legends, uh, as well as something that we've created called the Cultural Memory Timeline. And um, whoop. Um, can you see the video? We don't see a video, we just oh. see your slide. Oh, you do? Okay. The first slide. Yeah, because I saw that little icon that says start video and it has an X through it. So I was like, oh, oh that was can... just for you. We don't okay. see your face. Okay. As long as you can see the presentation, I guess. But yes. Uh, 
every single culture and every single corner of the planet has a creation story. And when it came to the um, traditional stories of the Goose Cap and Goose Cap legends, I thought, what better place to start than the creation story itself? And uh, we're talking about the people of Mi'kma'ki here, the traditional people of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, uh, central and eastern shores of New Brunswick, and even a bit of northern Maine. So this is the culture of the Mi'kmaq people and our teachings. Even before the point of European contact, uh, we know that these stories have been passed on from generation to generation for literally thousands of years. Uh, they're referred to as the Glooscap legends, uh, some of them being created by Glooscap, some of them was that were created in his honor uh, for some of the places that we have here in the provinces, as well as um, the animals and our relationship that we have with them. So even though they're still considered Glooscap legends, um, they may not include the character Glooscap himself. Uh, Glooscap was the first man created by the creator. Uh, he was created in the Bay of Funday. Uh, this is a picture of Cape Blomidon, which was seen as one of Glooscap's campsites. Now, the thing about that creation story, um, it talks about Glooscap being created by the creator by three bolts of lightning. Uh, the, the first bolt of lightning just gave him a shape of a human being on the landscape there at Cape Blomidon. The second bolt of lightning gave him life but he was still fastened to the earth. So all he could do was observe and learn. And the third bolt of lightning finally set him free. So that way he could take his teachings to the different people uh, in the different lands as he traveled throughout. Uh, he was introduced to different members of his family. Being the first man there, the first one that he came into contact with was a stone that was being heated up by the sun. And there was a transformation of that stone into an older female figure, and she introduced herself as Glooscap's grandmother. So that was the second figure here. Uh, the third figure here came from the foam that was being created by the waves on the beach there and along the shoreline. And from that was the transformation of a young man, and it was introduced as Glooscap's nephew. And of course, being a nephew, you're thinking, well, it had to be his, the child of his brother or sister. So the next one that he came across to came from was a transformation uh, that came from a leaf. And that was Glooscap's mother himself. So the third person he met was actually his mother. So as all the story builds and the different gifts are being given to Glooscap, uh, there's that relationship that he had with the animals that were already here and the teachings about how man and animal were to survive here on this land. Uh, from the creation story itself and how he basically talked about uh, the way that things were going to be, uh, animals and humans were on a level playing field and animals had the ability to communicate with man uh, before uh, or during Glooscap's time here. And as Glooscap left, the farther he got away from our people, the more disconnect there was to the animal kingdom. Uh, even when it talks about that whole series of stories, of course, the Glooscap legends end with his departure story. It talks about Glooscap calling for a whale and a smaller whale had come and where Glooscap was 40 feet tall, he needed a larger uh, vessel to travel on. And when the whale came, one of the largest whales that we have, taken Glooscap to different lands, uh, Glooscap gifted the whale his pipe. And uh, that's what we see whenever we're out on a whale watch and you see that little blow, the, the little um, blow stem off of a whale. Uh, that's said to be the um, smoke from Glooscap's pipe that he's smoking. And even in the Mi'kmaq language, uh, the Mi'kmaq word, like it's a verb-based language, so it's either descriptive or distinctive. Uh, the name for whale is Budap. And Budap in the Mi'kmaq language means the one that blows. So you get a lot of these lessons and stories, even within the, a single word itself, 
It's like, you know, they can teach you uh, so much. Even when it comes to a single artifact, I mean, one little thing that we have, it has stories and it has stories that tell us even in this contemporary form. Uh, coming from an archeological site, Camp de Burt, this was the very, very first artifact that was found in that location way back in 1948. I talked about that archeological connection before, but this is a Clovis point. Just by looking at that point and looking at the material that it was made from, by looking at the style and the technique that they were using for the day, uh, it's considered a Clovis point. And that takes it back in time from nine to 14,000 years old. So right away that tells, begins to start telling the story. Uh, Department of Education was calling it an Indian arrowhead. And I was like, well, there's two things wrong with that. Number one, it's too large to be the projectile point of a bow and arrow. And another thing is where we had the ability to radiocarbon date this artifact that went back over 13,300 years, it predates the bow and arrow technology. So it's like, well, what were our ancestors using before the bow and arrow? Well, the grandfather of the bow and arrow is the Adelaide and Dart system. And uh, Adelaide is a very, very flexible spear that you have, and it's thrown with a lever. And uh, you have a sort of increased power because you're moving that little projectile point uh, from a very, very short distance during the same period of time as you would by extending, uh, by using this lever that you're throwing, you're throwing it a longer distance in the same period of time. So it actually accelerates. So here's the device itself. The atlatl is the lever, the atlatl dart, is the projectile about five to six feet long. And uh, got a oops, little bit of animation there to show you how it's thrown. And um, that's, like I said, some people have a whippet or a chuck it to throw a little tennis ball if you're playing fetch for your dog. Well, this is the same technology as using the combination of the um, technology of leverage, as well as what's something that's called stored spring energy. Uh, when you throw the atlatl, um, it has a, a bit of resistance because of that point. So the shaft of the atlatl actually flexes. And when it comes off of the atlatl point, there's a definite thrust to it. Uh, the world record for an atlatl throw is some 834 feet. So if you imagine a football field being 100 yards, that's 300 feet. So if you stick these up, three football fields end to end or three soccer fields, uh, you're going to get the distance that you can throw this atlatl and dart. Uh, again, we brought that back to the 400th anniversary at Grand Pre. And um, what we did was we had 3D animals set up and people could throw the atlatl at a full-size bison, a uh, full-size elk, and a full-size moose. Uh, we had styrofoam 3D targets. And people lined up from all over for literally days. Uh, even in the pouring rain, we had a lineup of people that were willing to throw this. And husbands were um, competing against wives. Uh, parents were competing against their children. It was a pretty fun event. And the thing is, when we were teaching, we were saying that it doesn't matter what culture you come from on the planet. Your culture used the atlatl and dart system before the bow and arrows. Um, it's found on six of the seven continents. Uh, the only place that it hasn't been found is Antarctica. And that's still a ball, uh, a chunk of ice. So um, they hadn't really um, found one there yet, but they, they may yet. <laughs> so um, it doesn't matter what your ancestry is, uh, your people definitely use the atlatl and dart as well. Uh, even when it comes to the stories that are found on those rocks, uh, we had the ability to take blood samples that were in the cracks and crevices. And that talked about the kin of the caribou. And um, everyone knows what a caribou is. That's that animal that's on our 25 cent piece. And for the younger viewers, uh, that's the animal that pulls Santa's sleigh. But um, 
A lot of people don't know that that's a Mi'kmaq word. And again, in that verb-based language, look at the word caribou. In the original Mi'kmaq language, the pronunciation was kalibu. And kalibu, when you say kalibu in the Mi'kmaq language, that means to shovel. And that's what these animals do. They shovel the uh, snow to get to the grasses and they shovel the lichens and mosses off of the trees in order to feed. Uh, but it was our ancestor hunting his ancestor and that was the stag moose. So it was the blood of his ancestor that was here before him. And that blood analysis that was found on those projectile points, uh, the biface knife blades that would have been used to clean the animals, as well as the projectile points that were meant to hunt or harvest them, uh, they tell a story as well. So this is all part of that story uh, compilation of um, the different pieces. Every single piece is like a piece of a puzzle. And as you put these pieces together, it paints the big picture and you can see different things that we have. Even when we take a look at the anatomy of a story itself, uh, I give you a pretty good sample of um, what I learned when I first started way back in 2005, when I started with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. My first job was to read all the resource material that they had on the Mi'kmaq Divert Project. I picked up this one album and it showed a picture of this plant and it said, my mother used to call this plant little bluebirds. It said Norma. And I'm like, that's awesome. I said, my grandmother also gave me teachings about this plant. And she called it Eoneg Jipjij. Eoneg Jipjij in the Mi'kmaq language translates to little bluebirds. <laughs> so I was wondering who this Norma was and why she knew that and was gifted it from her grandmother and why I had that same gift. Well, I told the story that my grandmother showed me this plant when I was a child. And she said it's called little bluebirds. And I said, well, it doesn't look like a little bluebird to me. So what my grandmother did was she took the flower in her hand and she peeled the petals off of it. And in her hand, she had all the little blossoms separately. And each one of these blossoms looked like a little bluebird. If it hadn't fully flushed, it looked like the wings were down by its side. But as the flower started to blossom and it started to open up, it looked like a little bluebird that she had in her hand. And she said, Eoneg means smoky blue or cloudy blue. And Jipjij is just a bird that's small. So Eoneg Jipjij literally translates to a blue bird small. <laughs> but um, when I realized that, okay, I have this teaching. And I'm like, who's Norma? And they said, well, you know who Norma is. Um, that's Mo, Mo Prosper. And uh, the thing is, this plant, it's part of the sweet pea family, and it does produce a pea, but the peas are toxic. Um, you only eat the peas of this plant, not for food, not for nourishment, but you use them for medicines. If you got a piece of a bad meat that was inside you and you was causing you problems, stomach problems, um, you want to get that bad piece of meat out. That's what you do is eat some of these peas that would induce vomiting and it would clear your system. So it's not something you ate for nourishment, but ate for medicines. And uh, when I think about my learn my teachings, uh, this is my grandmother and. Um, well, I don't know, we got my mouse going here. That's my gram. This is actually my mother. And that's my uncle, Dan. And I was thinking about the time period that that represents. That teaching came from that woman. And I got looking at sort of myself and Mo's family. And I passed that teaching on to my two sons. And my youngest son was born in 1994. I was born in 1959. Mom was born in 1929, and I knew that my grandmother was born in 1909. But the thing was, I didn't know the actual year of birth for my great-grandparents or my great-great-grandparents. So I just used 20 years. And I got back to the year 1889, 
And I'm like, that's when Norma and I had the same great, great grandparents. Our great, great grandparents had two daughters. And like you see the little pink ones are the girls, the blue ones are the boys. One daughter went on to become no, uh, Norma's ancestor or, Mo, or Mo's ancestor and gave her that same teaching. And my grandmother went on to be our family line with all of our aunts and uncles and all of our cousins on our side. So looking back some five generations, I knew that photography started in the mid 1800s. So I Googled 1869 native life. And this is what I popped up, popped up with these three women. And it's like, that's when natives were still natives and living on the land as the natives did traditionally. And I was looking at that picture as a representation of, um, of who our families were. It's like, that was my great, great, great grandmother who had two daughters, one that became Norma's family and the other one that became a descendant of my family. So it puts it into perspective for some of these minds going back to 1869. Uh, kids look at me today and I'm over half a hundred and they have a hard time conceiving <laughs> how long I've been on the planet. But that's sort of how these uh, stories go. And, uh, what happened here? It seemed to be locked for some reason. There we go. And a lot of these stories that were passed down traditionally were done orally. They weren't written words. It wasn't until these ethnographers started to come to this area and write down our stories. They were being told that this tribe of Indians that lives in eastern Canada, they're going to be dead and gone in 20 years. I'm happy to say that um, we're still here, even though they were told that 150, 200 years ago. But what they did was they recorded all of our stories and writings. Um, and what they had done was um, these ethnographers that were traveling here were writing about our practices and our protocols. And we still have those stories today. But a lot of people think that they were just stories that were created to amuse the minds of children, sort of a bedtime story, something that you tell them until they fall asleep. But it's like, no, it's like the oral traditions that we had, a lot of it was based on fact, a lot of it was based on truth, and a lot of it was used for education. So what we had done was we had taken Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge in Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge, we'd embedded it in a story and passed the stories on, and that information went with them. So even now today, when you pick up this old recording of our story and you read it, it points to a different place, it points to a different time, and it points to a perspective that our ancestors were gifting us uh, to be told today and even to be understand today. Uh, another one of the ones that we have here is Wallace and Wallace. Uh, I should go back. Uh, Silas T. Rand. He was one of the first people that worked and probably the most prominent and famous of all the storytellers that recorded the legends of um, the Mi'kmaq. Uh, you can actually Google um, Mi'kmaq legends by Silas T. Rand, and you can get volumes of these stories, literally dozens. Another one is uh, the Mi'kmaq Indians of Eastern Canada. Uh, written by Wallace and Wallace. And again, the ethnographers that were in this area recording, uh, they had purchased a lot of material while they were in this area. And that's still sitting in the George Gustav Hyde Museum in New York City, as well as the American Museum of the American Indian in Washington, um, D.C. at the uh, Smithsonian. And so a lot of these things are still uh, there. And we go visit them every now and then to get more information and more stories from these uh, artifacts and items. Uh, but again, uh, the main bucket that I found was um, an ethnographer by the name of Hoffman. And he wrote his doctorate theses on traditional stories and had a fascination for Aboriginal culture. And he collected volumes and volumes of books that were written by literally dozens of these ethnographers. I found some 48 volumes 
And when Hoffman was here on the East Coast writing his thesis, he ended up over in Washington, D.C. before he died, or not Washington, D.C., but Washington State over on the West Coast. And when he died, he had donated his entire research collection to the um, University of California. And they have since digitized these books, uh, scanned them in, made them into like a, a digital format for all these iBooks and e-readers and iPads. It's like everything's digital today. And I came across the in the University of California, 48 volumes that he used in his bibliography. So literally hundreds and hundreds of stories. Uh, one of my favorite books is called Goose Cap, The Liar and Other Indian Tales. I never even heard of that publication before until I found that wealth of, uh, of stories there. And even when you're researching Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq stories, you got to remember that we didn't always spell it M-I apostrophe K-M-A-Q or M-I apostrophe K-M-A-W. It's like, you want to go back, then you want to go Mi'kmaq, M-I-C-M-A-C. That's what they used to call us. And even the fact that we're part of the Algonquian nation, um, you, know, you search for Algonquian, you're going to find Mi'kmaq information. And even going back before uh, the English, uh, we had a relationship with the French. Uh, there were French referred to us as the Siroquois. We weren't Mi'kmaqs to them, we were Siroquois. And there's a lot of documents. So depending on how far you want to go back in your research and what information you want to get, you got to refer to all the different names that were referred to historically. Uh, and even in a contemporary format, there's a lot of wonderful publications out there that are very, very new and very contemporary. And again, some of them are collections of old stories as well as some are new creations and new stories based on the characters that we had. So uh, easy to find this information on legends and stories. And again, some of these stories go old school. Old schools are oral stories. And that's when you're talking to our elders. Uh, this is Mi'kmaq elder uh, Basil Peters, who originated in the Bear River area but had moved to Millbrook here in central Nova Scotia before he had passed. And I spent a lot of time with Basil and uh, he had a basket shop where I used to sell my crafts out of and my artwork. And uh, my brother actually purchased the basket shop from him before he passed away. So the basket shop's actually still in the family. But just, Thinking back on those stories that Basil shared with me, uh, that was old school stuff. And uh, it's just like hearing stories from your grandfather. And just like stories from your grandfather, uh, <laughs> sometimes they get repeated. <laughs> I heard some of the stories that Basil had shared with me many times over. <laughs> but uh, that's basically how and where you're going to find this information today. Uh, one of the first jobs that I had with the Confederacy and Mainland Mi'kmaq was to read all the legends that I could to see if there was reference to any place names. Uh, we were working with the Place Names Digital Atlas, which is part of St. Mary's University and the Grossborg Research Center. And uh, it's an online digital map that refers to old traditional Mi'kmaq place names. And when I was working on that project, reading all the legends and stories, my boss said that I want you to map them, put them on a map and see if they're associated with the material that our ancestors used. He knew that a lot of these stories referred to stones or the throwing of stones or the creation of things from stone. And so he wanted to know if that's what we had indeed on hand. And you had to do your homework for some of these stories. Uh, one of the ones that I had collected it referred to a place called Konomi Akadi. And soon as I heard Akadi, it's like, okay, uh, that's what the French referred to this area as. But I had to go back really, really to old stuff. Uh, this back, I think it goes back into um, 1768. It's an old French map. And I found Konomi Akadi. But where I found it, 
it's a place called Economy today. Economy is a very, very English town and economy is a very, very English word. The English took this over from the French in a battle. The French were calling this area l'économie. And phonetically, that's how economy got its name. The French were calling it l'économie, the English called it economy, and again, sounded like the same place. But again, the French had it for some 80 years, and they took it from the Mi'kmaq word kenomi. And in the Konomi, in the Mi'kmaq verb-based language, Konomi means a piece of land that juts out into the water. And indeed, if you look at the shoreline of the Minas Basin and you find this little bulbous bump, it's like, yeah, that's where Economy is and uh, Economy Mountain. It's like, uh, that's Konomi, the piece of land that juts out into the water. So it's transcended three different cultures, three different languages, but still looking back at the old original story, it says what it means in that verb-based language, and we still haven't lost that. Uh, even when we talk about one of the famous mo or most famous stories of the Goose Cap legends, you can't deny that the Mi'kmaq Five Islands, talking about Goose Cap having a battle with Giant Beaver and how he threw these five sods of mud at him, creating that chain of um, islands in the Bay of Funde, started to run Giant Beaver off. And uh, this sort of the depiction of a, or an illustration of Goose Cap throwing those sods at uh, Giant Beaver. Uh, and even knowing that uh, Giant Beaver, um, Latin name is Castorides ohioensis, um, he was seven feet tall and he weighed close to a thousand pounds. Now they found the remains of four of these and they say that he died off about 85 Hundred year, or 8,500 years ago. Definitely represents our time period here, being here for over 13,000 years. We spent 5,000 years with this animal here before it went extinct. And the thing about Castorides ohioensis is he didn't have a big flat tail like a beaver. He had a long hairless tail like a muskrat. And looking at our, our oh, shall we, more of the introduction, I guess. This is actually the um, the incisor of a giant beaver, and um, that's in compared to the the skull of a giant beaver compared to the skull of a beaver that we have today. So he was quite a formidable animal, and was definitely a part of our characters and reference stories. But we have a story about how beaver got its tail, and it talks about even our ancestors passing that piece of information on that. This animal always didn't have a tail like that. And the story of Goose Cap Legends talks about um, beaver having a tail like a, like a muskrat. And the beaver was a lot larger than a muskrat. So he was complaining, the muskrat was complaining about this tail is way too biggy for me. And the beaver was saying, well, I got this little tail. He said, I could handle something that size. So we should exchange our tails. So, well, we're going to have to go see Goose Cap about that. And it basically just refers to our traditional knowledge that that animal didn't always have a tail like that. It's not so much a true story, but it's just sort of an explanation. We got another story in the Bay of Funde that talks about the three sisters and talks about how these three sisters were playing a prank on Goose Cap. Goose Cap was hunting a moose. And the closer Goose Cap got to the moose, the sisters would chase this little moose off so that way he couldn't catch up with it. And then when Goose Cap figured out what the sisters were doing, he turned them to stone. And it's now a stone formation off of the um, Bay of Funde. And uh, it's an actual site that you can go visit. Here's the three sisters themselves in a photograph of them being turned to stone. And uh, just part of our, our collection of stories that we have in uh, sort of that. When you take a look at it here, you see um, what we have is we've got um, a sandy beach, uh, sand, we've got beach grass growing, we've got shorebirds on the beach. And the thing about this beach is it's 150 feet in the air. Uh, on that beach, you're gonna find stones that have been cobbled by the world's highest tide. 
but it's not that the waters were 150 feet deeper, it's that that piece of land was once down at sea level. And when you look at that volcanic basalt that's right underneath the shoreline, it matches with the volcanic basalt with the material that is down below. They once were together. And we have a story in our inventory that talks about the times the rivers flowed backwards. And what that refers to is a period of time where when you're looking at water, a little stream's gonna flow down into a creek. That little creek's gonna flow downstream into a brook. That little brook is gonna flow downstream into a river. And that river and it's gonna to flow to the shoreline where it meets the ocean. Well, because of plate tectonics and the movement of plates squeezing and pushing together under high pressure when Nova Scotia was being formed, the, the pieces of land had popped and we got these raised areas of beaches in Nova Scotia. And um, if you go to the Funde Geological Museum and you learn about some of these things, what you're gonna learn is that didn't take place like you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago or anything. It, it took place only 6,000 years ago in the formation of Nova Scotia. And again, if our people were here 13,000 years, then we were here the day that that happened. And such a land movement of 150 feet, uh, that's something that legends were made of. That's something that would, people would tell stories of. And all of a sudden, this raised beach that was once at the shoreline is now 150 feet in the air. Water definitely did indeed run backwards. And that's what we can do is we can look at goose cap legends through something that we refer to today as edamumptum. Edamumptum is two-eyed seeing. And it's our old traditional stories and the confirmation of these by the Western world and Western science. And it talks about um, sort of one way of looking at things and one story or interpretation being confirmed by science and scientific events. That's what um, created our cultural memory timeline. It's like, here's the story we have. Here's the interpretation of that story based on the history of this land and the science that we have. And they're telling the same story about the exact same place. This creates not only stories of cultural significance, but it creates sites of cultural significance in the indigenous people. We have a landscape here that our people have lived on that is very, very special and has significance on a very spiritual level. And that's what a lot of these stories do, is they point to different places in time. Uh, we've got Goose Caps Cave up in Cape Breton Island. And um, a lot of people consider that a very, very sacred site. Uh, we have outside the cave itself, we have a guardian that looks after that. And this maiden who looks after the cave, um, they said that there was two maidens that looked after the cave, but there's one right here in the form of like her, her forehead, her eye, her nose, uh, her lips, her chin. Um, that's right outside of Gooscap's cave. Now, my wife Natalie and I, we were taken there and um, by Andrew Sark and by Clifford Paul, and uh, both of them from Cape Breton took Natalie and I in there. And they both said that, well, this is the face of one of the guard, our maidens that guards the cave, but we haven't found the second one. So we don't know if that is literally uh, because of uh, um, whether it has fallen off or into there, or whether it's not as defined as it used to be, but this face definitely is. Uh, we have another story that talks about Goosecap having a battle with the God of Winter and how he lost that battle. And uh, we are right now, we're ready to share our story. Uh, come the 1st of February, we have the feast of Apuganajit. Apuganajit is this winter god that had defeated um, Gluskap and it was winter here year round. So what we do to appease the Mi'kmaq, so um, Apuganajit, 
A Puganija is not only the name of our winter god, but it's also the name of our month of February, which is our hardest month and the hardest one to get through. But what we do is the feast of a Puganija, you set an extra setting at your table and you set it outside. We talked about this one in the spirituality um, um, talk that I gave you guys. But again, that's coming up. And um, by leaving this offering outside, he's going to come and he's going to take this. He's going to get a full belly. He's going to get sleepy. He'll go to sleep and the winter will be over and we'll have an early spring. That's the whole intention of the Feast of Apuganajit. Thing with um, Apuganajit is he's a Migmwasu, just like Guskap. He's a shapeshifter. He can come in any form to claim that. So if you put an offering of food out there, he can come in the form of a blue jay. He can come in the form of a crow. He can come in the form of a fox. He can come in the form of a squirrel. He's so clever that he's going to disguise himself when he comes to get that offering. Even he, he can even come disguised as your neighbor's dog. <laughs> Somebody is going to come to do that. And that's what we do every year is we leave an offering out at the 1st of February or some places do it the very, very last of January, uh, January 31st. So that way it's there for them on the 1st of February. But that Cape Breton bunch, they're the ones that are the most traditional. Uh, they put the celebration out on January 29th. Because when, if you put it out on January 29th, our old month system of being 13 months of 28 days, the 29th day of January would indeed be the first day of our second month in our culture. So it's kind of hard to follow, but um, like I said, that Cape Breton bunch is where a lot of the language is, where a lot of the tradition is, a lot of the old stories. So a lot of our wisest of elders are coming from the island. And um, yeah, these are the stories that they shared with me. Oh, I don't know if that was. But even when I'm talking about that, story that we have about a Puganija winning that battle with the god of winter. Um, Uskap lost. He had to move south and he took his people south with him because we only had one season here. That was winter. And the winter period had destroyed all the plants. The plants didn't come back. So the animals started dying off. And that there is when we lost a lot of our large megafauna animals from the ice age is during that period of time. And another thing is even being one season at a time, it's like it was winter here year round. Uh, that's evident in our soil. Again, looking at Edamumptunk and looking at the cultural memory timeline, looking at the soil in Nova Scotia, there's a period of five to 800 years that says that the ice age came back and that there was no vegetation here. Soil pedologists who study the pollen samples inside the soil saying that there's no pollen in the soil here. There were no plants. Uh, so that ice age came back. So that's that edamumptum two-eyed seeing part of our culture where um, we say that this event happened and science is saying, yeah, it did indeed happen. That winter did come back. It was sort of a little mini ice age for five to 800 years. And even looking historically at the landscape and looking at the soil around this inland lake that represents where Shubenacadie and uh, Stuyak are, uh, traditional lake they called Lake um, Shubenacadie. And all around this lake are archaeological evidence of different communities living there when that was still a body of water. 6,000 years ago, the Minas Basin created inside the Bay of Fundy, all the way into the town of Coral. That happened when the Minas Basin geofracture ripped open and that drained the water in that area from that lake. And if you look at the um, elevation map there, you notice that the Shubenacadie River's in there and that area down there is very, very green. And today it represents like Hans County and probably the largest majority of farmland that you're going to find. Very, very rich, very, very fertile. 
again, the soil pedologists are going into this area and saying, the reason why this area is so rich is because it's the sediment of a large inland lake. And we're like, just like our stories and the evidence tells us that this was once a lake, that those stories are still in our culture. They're still in there talking about the land and the changes. And like I said, again, that goes back 6,000 years, according to science. Uh, one of the sites that we have here, very, very uh, strong is Partridge Island. And Partridge Island is where Gooscap's grandmother had her site. And you can see right across the bay is Cape Blomidon. And um, yeah, it is on the left-hand side when you go north of it. <laughs> Most people see Cape Blomidon from uh, the valley and it's over on the right-hand side. But again, this is north of it. So it's on the reverse side. But when Gooscap left her people, the story says that Gooscap made an amethyst necklace for his grandmother before he left. And sure enough, you can find amethyst there on Partridge Island. It's site specific. That's what the stories do. They tell you about the areas and they tell you that this is why this story originates from this area. And again, as grandmother's cooking pot, um, her campsite is referred to Goose Cap's grandmother's cooking pot. She was always ready to receive company. If you cut off a piece of stew meat, it would just grow back. And um, again, it's located on a volcanic fault line, that minus basin geofracture that ripped open. And it was liquid magma coming up from the cracks that was cooling in the water. And the air holes that were around this island, uh, the air holes solidified in the material itself. So twice a day, every day, when the Bay of Funday tides come in, the water pushes the air out of the air holes and air pockets and the water around the island boils and bubbles like a coconut pot. <laughs> so definitely a story that is confirmed by legends and time as well as science today. And uh, you can still see it happen. Uh, best time to go, what you wanna do is you wanna look at the tide times for Parsboro because Parker John's about uh, two kilometers up the road from the town of Parsboro. So looking at their tide times, what you wanna do is you wanna look at the high tide time for the day. Say, for example, it was at three o'clock in the afternoon today. Then you wanna be out there about two hours before the high tide. That's when the water's pushing the air out, the water's boiling and bubbling all around there. So just two hours before the high tide time. And again, it does that twice a day, every day. And again, looking at that area, uh, the, you don't have to read this whole thing. Everything said on the last paragraph. It says on the shoreline can be found rock and sediment ranging in origin from 300 to 175 million years ago. And among these materials can be found samples of nearly every mineral in the world. And these are some of the samples of the, the material you're gonna find in that island created in that unique place under unique conditions. And that there is the opening of the minus basin geofracture where liquid stone had come out and cooled at high temperatures over a short period of time, the, it started to dry and form cracks and crevices. And inside these cracks and crevices were filled by um, quartzite, by agates, by different stones that our ancestors used to make artifacts. That's the desirable material. And even behind my son's head, you can see the volcanic basalt that had taken this sandy beach and created that volcanic glass out of there that when you chip it, it breaks off predictably. So you can use this material to create tools. Um, and again, it's just a matter of um, finding material that is hard or as hard, giving it a smack. It comes off in concordal fractures in a 45 degree angle. So it's very, very predictable and you get the desired tools that you want. And when you look at these 13,000 year old tools, these are drills, uh, these are hide scrapers, again, made from that specific material. Uh, these are bone wedges for cutting bone and for making bone tools. They're all made from semi-precious jewels. And again, uh, we had a project, this is sort of a more contemporary story, 
is the Eldon George project. We took the material to Eldon there when he had the shop up in Parsboro. And a lot of people are impressed with the fact that I know Eldon George. And they're like, how well do you know Eldon George? And I said, well, medium coffee, two cream, one sugar. So if you know what somebody takes in their coffee, you know them pretty well. And I worked with Eldon for years when I worked for Department of Natural Resources. And I also worked with Eldon with the Migmoy de Burr project. And unfortunately, we lost that man and that wealth of knowledge. And uh, But again, I still pass on a lot of his teachings and give him credit where it's definitely due. But again, he's responsible for the inventory map of the province of Nova Scotia. When you look at it, you can see that it's quite a bit different. And the reason being is it's created from different places. This part here in Cumberland County is probably the only place indigenous to North America. South of us, all this orange and yellow and red, that's coming from the continent of Africa. And everything from Picto to Anaganish to Cape Breton Island, that's all coming from Europe. So you're getting materials as the mega continent of Pangaea started to break up. Nova Scotia had a piece of all three places. So that's why you can literally get material here in Nova Scotia from all over the world. So you don't need to travel the world and collect them. Here's this example. This was an artifact that was found at Dollar Lake in behind the Halifax airport. It's made out of red jasper and it has veins of green jadeite in it. This was an artifact that was found at Migmoy de Burt. Again, red jasper with veins of green jadeite. It's actually my son who found it when he was working there, when he was working through college. And he um, brought that home and I said, you take that back. I said, that's an artifact. And you can see that that artifact was actually created from that stone. Uh, that material does not come from Halifax County. That material does not come from Colchester County. And working with Eldon, we went to different sites in the province and collected the raw materials that our ancestors were using to create these stones. He identified 13 different unique uh, materials we were using. Uh, Mr. Eldon George is the man there with the red backpack. Uh, Roger Lewis is the Mi'kmaq ethnographer at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History in Halifax. And the woman with the vest on, that there is my wife, Natalie, who worked with us for four years. And uh, when she was uh, part of the heritage interpretation team at the Millbrook Heritage Center. And uh, she spent some time out with us and spent quite a bit of time with Eldon as well. So going out onto the land and collecting these materials. We mapped them. You'd see where the artifacts were coming from, but you could see where the material originated. And when you put them on a map, you could see trade routes and travel ways of our people. And that was the story that we were looking to tell and sort of a unique way of looking. Uh, 13,000 years ago, the Mi'kmaq moved in here because of the Wisconsin glaciation. East of us was the Atlantic Ocean. North and west was still a solid block of ice. So we had to get our material sourced locally. And so that's why we knew that these artifacts were created by the material here. So what we're saying, even that story, what it tells us was wherever our people migrated into this area from 15, 17,000 years ago, they already had a knowledge of geology. And they had a knowledge of how to read the land and how to look for desirable material. With Migmoy de Burt, we have some 4,600 artifacts that are made out of semi-precious stones that come from the Bay of Funday and the Cubiquid fault line, as well as the Minus Basin Geofractor. And our people told stories about those places. So these are the story sites. These are the sites of the cultural significance where the stones were created and the fault lines. There's definitely an overlay for a lot of those stories. Uh, the Department of Tourism since 1930s has been calling this uh, the Goose Cap Trail because of the amount of Goose Cap legends that are coming from this area. And when you take a look at the fault line, every single town or every circle that you see on there is not only a site where I could tell you a cultural story from, but it's also a place where you can go to gather cultural material like semi-precious jewels. 
And again, right on two of the largest fault lines in the province. North of the Minus Basin is a Cubquid fault line and south of it is the Minus Basin geocut. And again, that's the end result is seeing what's inside and knowing what you're looking for. So I think uh, we're gonna pull the plug on us right now and stop sharing, but I don't know if I see uh, one little Q and A. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, so um, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came out as well as some comments about the beautiful artwork, which we will, if y'all stay tuned and join us for uh, March Social Work Month, we will be giving as a, a present to some lucky person who as part of our, um, our uh, drawing will have that, so stay tuned. Um, so two questions came up. One was, as you were talking about the legend, um, how was music or song perhaps part of how some legends were shared from generation to generation? That was one was, question. Well, that one question would be better answered by someone like Trevor Gould, who spent a lot of time. I myself have not spent a lot of time with um, songs, but I know that... Uh, we did the integrated fine arts and I talked about the art component. We brought in other specialists that referred to the songs, a lot of which come from the animals themselves by the sound of nature. Uh, and again, music is a reflection of your language. It's a very, very guttural language. It's a very, very guttural sounding music. It's like they're one and they go hand in hand. Um, we had a champion fiddler here uh, by the name of Lee Cremo. And um, he played a lot of um, fiddles, like a lot of the um, Irish and Scottish tunes. But they said that he stuck out amongst all the rest because he played with a Mi'kmaq accent. And I thought that was an interesting concept to music is to have a little different flair to it. And by him putting that little bit of Mi'kmaq on these ancient Irish and Scottish songs, he stood out above the rest in competition. And uh, he's had four time world champion. But uh, language, yeah, that, or the, the language of the music and that, that, for, that somebody else's uh, strength, not mine. <laughs> so. Well, we want to say thank you so incredibly much for um, your wisdom, your sharing, your artwork. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And I know we all learned so much. There was one other question that was around. Uh, families and child rearing, which I feel could be a whole presentation unto itself. So oh, yeah. I apologize that we didn't get a chance to get to it. But luckily, um, Gerald will be coming back um, again. And we are grateful to him for sharing so much of his knowledge and helping us understand this beautiful land upon which we are with uh, far more depth and appreciation. We are grateful to you, Gerald, um, and to all of the knowledge keepers and wisdom that they shared with you and all of the elders who shared their wisdom with you so that we could learn and hopefully be better. We are yeah. grateful to you all and uh, we'll all it to you, Gerald, we'll all you to all of you and uh, we look forward to you joining us for our next TV. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for all the kind words I'm seeing floating up in front of me on the chat stuff. So all the hands and hearts and clapping. So yeah, it's all well cool. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Guys.